Uh, hello and a very warm welcome to this Explain Pain in the Clinic. My name is Joanna Taylor and I am Director of NOI in Europe and I'm joined this morning by my very good friend and Principal NOI teacher Tim Beams. Morning Tim. Morning. Tim has been a NOI teacher for well over 15 years. He has taught literally hundreds of Explain Pain courses to thousands of clinicians all over the world. Tim is an active clinician himself, specializing in complex and persistent pain. He is also founder of an organization called La Pub Scientifique, which is an online platform for clinicians to learn about the latest developments in clinical practice and pain research directly from the researchers and the pain specialists. So if any of you would like to check that out. I'm just going to ask Tim if he will drop the link to La Pub Scientifique in the chat, please. And uh, maybe Tim also drop the link to the podcast because that's a really fabulous free resource that La Pub creates. Um, so moving on, Tim is also co-author of the Graded Motor Imagery Handbook with David Butler and Lorimer Mosley. These sessions uh, are all about giving you a taste of Explain Pain and how to practically use it in the clinic. Some of you will have already done a course and for those of you who have already done the course, these sessions are designed to reinforce what you've already learned uh, and repeat and refresh. Uh, but if you're new to NOI or to Explain Pain and you haven't done a course, this session will give you a little taster of uh, what is covered in the core course. So it'll just give you a little insight about, about what is covered in the Explain Pain course. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the Explain Pain course later on. So just a couple of things to mention before we start. Uh, Tim will be talking for about 20 minutes. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A and we'll get to as many of them as we can. If you want to watch the recording of this session, you can access it in the uh, the NOI clinical discussion group, which is a Facebook group, or you can also access it now in on our YouTube channel, and I will drop the links for both of those places into the chat as Tim starts talking. So do come on over and join the clinical discussion group. It's a fabulous group. There's about two and a half thousand people in it. There's some great uh, bits of advice in there from NOI teachers and uh, content from David Butler. And also that's where all these uh, these recordings are put in there. And there's probably about 30 of these now said so on the whole variety of topics. So you can go and access those in the discussion group. Or, as I said, you can access our YouTube channel. And again, there's a growing library of these sessions in here, in there, uh, on a whole variety of subjects. So they're absolutely brilliant. Really, really good. Um, so let's get started. Today, we're talking about the practical application of the brain body connection. So Tim, can we kick off by talking a little bit about what is the brain body connection? Um, yes, uh, morning, everybody, or afternoon, evening, whatever it is. Um, yeah, so um, it seems obvious, doesn't it? <laughs> it's oh. the connection of the of the body to the brain and, and back again. Um, I suppose it sounds really intuitive now, doesn't it? So with our sort of knowledge of science and anatomy and, and what have you, but but obviously that sort of idea of that even the body could be connected with the brain isn't, isn't something that's always been apparent. Um, and if you go back, his, you know, historically, um there were ideas around the heart being the seat of the senses and the soul and, and what have you and, and in fact the brain was something that was just you know just dis discard literally discarded if you're an egyptian mummy then then they didn't have any interest in um embalming your brain and keeping that but uh, your heart on the other hand was a very important thing so <laughs> so so it sounds really intuitive now doesn't it but it's not always been the case yeah, and I think it is a it's a term that we're very used to hearing nowadays, but yet it's still not that well understood necessarily. So hopefully we're going to give a bit more insight into that today. Um, so yeah. I, well, should we should we should we add a little bit? Uh, yeah. That? And and people might you know 
body brain or or body mind or mind body connection I, I guess that would be another one that goes sort of hand in hand um and and if you think about how healthcare systems have been set up um that they they're sort of a product of history and historical underpinnings in healthcare which have their roots really in the last or since the renaissance period so and and a little and obviously a little bit further forward than that but but from people like Descartes and 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 then a little bit more recently people like um Sherrington and Cajal and and people bringing in the ideas of neuroscience and and pain but but one thing that you see in healthcare is you see a, a sort of typical split where you have medicine and psychology or psychiatry and and really there was the sort of physicalist perspectives of people treating body and then there was the mental side of it which is that Descartes, Descartes mm. um, dualist split of mind separate from body um, or soul separate from body or, or however you interpret it and and from a pain point of view um, there are strengths and weaknesses of that um, because it then focused attention on you know a painful body part and and if you've got a painful body part there's a couple of ways of thinking about how you do you know how you go about helping that and and yeah. and uh, and what we are i mean now appreciating more than for, for for a very long time and when i say very long time you know in other cultures historically people were quite comfortable thinking about the whole person um but but we are really only now just starting to more fully embrace the notion of the connections yet we still have going back to my example we still have like an orthopedic department or a um you have a, a a musculoskeletal department or or whatever and and so it's very much split in those ways and mm. someone comes in with back pain they do, it's not a person experiencing pain in their back that's you know affecting their life it, it's all sort of separated out and you even hear these things and i've worked in them in places where i've been working in the uh, oa knee clinic um it's not <laughs> It's like it's reduce and reduce and reduce down, isn't it? Um, and depersonalize in in some ways. And uh, mm. yeah, so so coming back to your original question, I mean, mind body connection to me sounds really sort of obvious and intuitive. Um, but when we actually start seeing, you know, how things are laid out for people, it, you know, it's understandable that someone who comes to see me experiencing pain might have a strong belief of a structural pathological anatomical problem causing their pain um and other people might be totally comfortable with the idea that um their emotional state influences the pain they're experiencing or whether or not people are with them at the time and having support from others are, is is helping them so so we have this it's a sort of interesting intersection in time in yeah. in beliefs i think yeah I, I i agree completely tim and i think that um we often come from the standpoint of you know you are you know absolutely at the cutting edge of understanding this and um all the work that you do you know with noi and with uh, la pub scientifique it's absolutely at the forefront of understanding this connection but then as you said you know still in modern healthcare we have these different departments and it's it, it's giving a completely different message isn't it out to the general populace yeah. so and when and when I learned to assess someone and and if I was when I worked in the National Health Service in the UK there would be if if someone came to me and they had knee pain um and at the same time they told me that they had back pain I would have to ask them to go and get another referral for their back pain yeah. and it was like oh, let's separate all those things out okay so this is where we're really going to come in here uh because um as a an active clinician yourself and um everybody in the audience are, um will be uh, probably clinicians and working within this system if you like so why do we need to understand this brain body connection in order to help patients 
Okay, well, the first thing to say is we don't always need to. <laughs> you know, if someone okay. comes in, they've got an acute injury, they might need a little bit of guidance and support through that process. And, and you don't need to establish any greater depths of understanding. Uh, uh, and, and, and that serves people well. Most of, I mean, there are people that go through life who never experienced persistent pain problems and, and mm. wow, that's amazing that they've done that. Um, but it's those times when, um, I, well, I think anyway, um, but of course in the acute pain situation, this might arise as well, but there are times when people come to us and things are persisting longer than they would have expected given whatever happened to them and uh, uh, if that if they can find a reason i mean things can come on spontaneously or insidiously as well can't they so yeah. so for me it would be helpful for some people where there's a persistence occurring uh, uh, for us to understand the connections the whole person uh, because on one level it allows us to make better sense of what it is that that person's experiencing and the impact that it has on their life. Mm -hmm. At another level, it opens up opportunities of how to and where to work. So yeah. they're, they're, they would be my two, I mean, that is so um, crude, <laughs> but that's sort of my reasoning in my head as I'm, I'm thinking about it. I know, I know in one sense it feels simplistic, but it's really necessary, isn't it, sometimes to actually just condense it into that so we, we know what we're looking at. Um, so we've got a great question, and actually, Mark, thank you. Perfectly timed as well. I think this will just slot in very nicely to the thread. So what approach would you suggest for patients with chronic pain that are reluctant to embrace the mind-body connection? Because they feel like this is assuming that it is all in their head or, or are making it up. Now, Mark, your question comes at exactly the sort of right point in the conversation so practically tim um how can we help our patients to understand uh understand this brain body connection without insinuating that it's all in their head yeah well i, well, I think the question is saying what approach would i suggest yeah um, which which would be that i'm uh, i'm have a sort of a thread through me which is I would be finding ways of asking that person to reflect mm. uh, reflect on what they're experiencing reflect on the current strategies that they view everybody's done stuff like everybody will have tried things yeah to, you know to some degree of success or other um so so having an understanding of, of what they've done how how effective it's been and let's be honest and whether or not they're open to exploring other things as well so um so that would be my starting point in terms of an approach so i'm thinking about um behavioral change relating to that person um because i might be able to support them in their current understanding without needing to bring in notions of of how the brain or the mind influences mm. a pain experience could you give me some examples of that just you know the sort of things that people might already be doing that you that you would get highlight that you would then hone in on to highlight to them that they're already understanding the brain body connection um uh well in the moment it would be a part of a conversation so i would be asking them you know about how things how things have panned out mapped out what sort of strategies they've used how effective they've been what they're mm. noticing what they feel like now reflecting back on having come and gone through that together um so sort of fairly deliberate sort of remapping re reprocessing of, of what they're experiencing there are ways then moving mark you know so let's say that they are open and there are ways because there are people who are well for, like let's let's say another thing he he says is is that this assumption that it's all in the head or they're making it up 
Well, we are precipitating some of those messages as well. So let's try and be, you know, let's be careful with how we say things and, and let's also see how it falls on that person. So mm. um, checking in on what they heard and what they're going to take away is an important part of that because you might say things very well meaning things, but the, it, the, the your intention isn't what they heard. It's not the message that they're taking with them. So so that's another thing and then and then that idea of making it up well that, that really is just has its roots in that mind body split doesn't it that if it's in the mind then yeah. it's not real it's not something we can measure it's not ob it's not an objective observable phenomena so therefore it's not real uh, mm. and that really is problematic in medicine that you have to be able to see it to for it to be real pain is not like that <laughs> you, you cannot see pain it's invisible you might be able to see mm. stuff happening in that person in their body or their behaviors you might be able to hear it in their language but you won't see it so we have to find ways of being able to communicate and opening up and listening and things that we've talked about before are important here um then <laughs> there would be practical things to do. Of course, there's practical things to do because you could easily just ask someone to uh, remember a time, you know, put Joe, mm. think of a time when you were um, when you were uh, nervous to do an exam or, or mm. um, <laughs> go on a date or something <laughs> like that. Um, or do a Facebook Live. <laughs> do a Facebook Live, yeah. You know, what do you notice just remembering that? Yeah. Yeah, you totally. You, I mean, you remember the feelings, the sensations that rise up in your body. You and, remember, the, and you, and you re, you've revisited some of it as well. You, re, you reconnect to that sense, don't I you? I am just thinking about our first Facebook Live now, Tim, that we did about 18 months ago. And I was for want of a better word, bricking it for about two days beforehand, because <laughs> it just was not something that we had, you know, we would we were done for. And but then this morning, um, now when I wake up, and I actually really look forward to doing these sessions with you. I love our conversations. I love the engagement with the audience. But I can literally feel already now, just thinking about that first one, my palms have gone sweaty. Right. Which is a lovely now for you that's worked for other people it won't work so then but there are ways of us being able to do that I, and I and I have like little things that I might say of, you know have you got someone that you love in your life that's special to you that's close to you can you just bring you know can you picture them now yeah. and, and 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 then just stay with that picture and and how does that feel in you um so they, 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 there are little things that I might do there um, that what I'm aiming to do with that is I'm trying to bring that physical experience in its, its experiential experience. <laughs> it's a terrible phrase, isn't it? Experiential experience of the connection between mind. You're picturing something. Yeah. It's not in front of you body you're feeling something in yourself so yeah that's uh, there are ways of of, of of us doing that practically yes there are, there are other ways of doing that as well and the protectometer would fit really beautifully here where the protectometer is is noticing the the things that are healthy or helpful or potentially um uh, safe in our life versus the ones that are threatening damaging uh, dangerous in our life and 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 exploring and noticing uh, the influences of for instance people uh, or being in certain places or certain things that we say to ourselves um, it, mentally as well and and so that would be a really beautiful tool to to start working and exploring those connections with someone mm. it's it's um Oh, really good question there, FST. Um, uh, I'll, I'll come to that in just one second. But Tim, this is just something that, for, from what I've experienced when you're teaching, is that you spend a, an enormous amount of time helping people to go through this process and understand exactly what they're extracting from what might seem like very simple conversations that they're having with a patient, but actually your information gathering, your listening, and your building that rapport and the trust with the patient and it, it seems to me that this this is now a much bigger part of uh clinical practice 
than it ever was before and actually so important for within the context of the explain pain approach what, what do you think about that um yes yeah i thought so i thought so because we're getting the feedback that we're getting now from the courses are really around this uh yeah. understanding the importance of this type of communication and that it isn't just about a set of words or a script it's about a journey that you're going on with somebody to help them understand all these much bigger concepts that are going in your head but it's about a conversation yeah yeah um and i did see a uh, uh tim can you give a specific example yeah. of how you have explained pain to someone thanks felicity um you're trying to pin me down you're gonna have to do better than that uh, <laughs> <laughs> um but, uh, I suppose an example would be 10 years ago when we taught explain pain, I was telling people what explain what pain was and, and I was telling them what I thought pain was and I would start talking about pain as an aporia or, um, you know, various different things, the subjective nature of pain or invisibility. Some of the stuff that I would still talk about, I teach, and when I say talk about, I'm talk about the same things, not always using the same words with my patients, but I talk about the same things. Um, now it's more conversation. So I'm just thinking about um, someone I was seeing just before the call. I d actually, I don't think we've ever specifically asked. Uh, he's never, we've never got to a point where we've tried to, to say, you know, philosophically, what do you think pain is? But we've been looking at the impact that pain has had on his life and how we can open it up and the different for him there have been certain triggers he's got an autoimmune disease so that so it's about understanding some of the biological effects for him in that and then how that impacts his life in other areas so so i would say that um it depends on the individual i i, I would be yeah i would be quite fluent and flexible with my with my talking mm. yeah mm. you probably so, you probably hear me talk a lot more here with joe than i do with my patients i hope that's given you some answer um felicity i have tried to pin tim down in the past so tim what do you say to your patients <laughs> and definitely in one of the episodes that we did a few weeks back i asked him how he starts the conversation and um oh i'm probably gonna get this wrong so i do apologize but it was um it was something very general like what are you, what do you expect or what would you like to get out of our session today and um yeah you know, and th those were just some of the things that you would you like to give us some examples of what you might say in a clinical interaction with somebody tim to help encourage them to understand because the last point on our on our um, agenda here today was to actually say ask you how can we help our patients to take on board the uh, body brain connection that you're starting to lay out in front of them through your conversation and questioning yeah. um, is how would you help them to take it perhaps to the next level of understanding yeah i hope yeah. i've got this right felicity yeah, that's fine. And I agree. Marie's just said it's less explaining, more exploring. I, I th actually, I think that love nice sort of re interpreting of, of explain pain because explain pain was a working title. And I know Loz and Dave never, mm. you know, well, they were always a bit uncomfortable about that. Um, uh, what was the question again? Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, I, I know, I know, I know what it was. It was, uh, how do we take them on? Well, I, I, I and I'm thinking about the guy I was working with just before now, so that's helpful, is that we are in a process where we're celebrating wins. So he's specifically looking for opportunities. I mentioned that word again, um uh for for wins in his life. And what he was feeding back, which was a lovely session actually, is that he started it by saying the first thing I've got to tell you is I've had the first pain free week for a couple of years. Um, and then he was like, well, it's not been totally pain free, but it's never, and, you know, and I've been able to do and he, he's then he was just sharing all the different wins uh, with me, which is just wonderful. And then in that moment, what we then did is a check in and how does that make you feel now? 
what are you feeling right now as you're telling me this um so what i'm trying to do is like an embodiment piece i'm just trying to get someone to notice in them how it feels that they've achieved all these things and uh instead of it just going woof flying by them noticing the the um success mm. and, and i think that's a big part of taking and running with something which i think was the question wasn't it um how do we mm. like creating habit around certain things if if it's an, an and the same guy was given exercise routines by another physio and it was painful every time he did it and he didn't want to do it no. <laughs> like obviously you're like why would i want to do this and that we've come come about it in a completely different way that has meant that there's freedom there um that he, you know that he's getting the success and and growing in an area without the need to be always suffering um, yeah so, so the so the answer i'm trying to give you is is you need to support knowledge through experience and if you experience things as going well or how you wish or towards values or whatever you however you want to explain it i think that is what powers it up that's a great quote tim supporting knowledge through experience and um interestingly enough if you have a look at sarah's question in the chat um, any tips to deliver explain pain to a group of eight to ten people it's harder to make it a reflective conversation uh i don't Sarah agree. hodgson yeah, yeah i i knew I was... you were going to say you didn't agree with that Sorry, i was Sarah. just going to say that you you would you demonstrate this in the courses i don't know if you've done this sarah i don't know if you've done a course with tim but you you're you're talk, you embody this process in the courses tim don't you and essentially you are working with a big group in a course yeah in the same way that you're working with a group in the course it translates very well to groups of patients I, I would I would say the place that we can do that eat most easily is on our um, winter school on the like where yeah. we have a reflective time and we talk and, and discuss things. So, yeah, in groups of however many um, um, th there are uh, what Sarah, if you work with groups, there is group management as well, because <laughs> there will be characters that, you know, that the, the, the sort of there's this power struggle isn't there sometimes. And um, yeah, so there are there are obviously um, there's a bit more to it than that. <laughs> it's feeling running a, a, a group as well. Um, I've, I've just there was another question that I thought would be quite interesting. How do you address questions about previous treatments that perhaps haven't been very helpful in respect in a respectful way? Thanks, uh, Margareta. Because um, because um, we I, one of the things that I've worked quite hard at on myself is to um l try and loosen my judgment <laughs> uh, um and with so, so the way that i would see this now is and we had the same conversation actually with this guy earlier um around exercise and we were just reflecting on whether exercise needed to be a part of his plan going forward and um i'm not i wouldn't i judge them actually because with their knowledge and skills and understanding at the moment this is what they've um recommended for you i personally i can understand why they've done that if i put my, put myself in their position and that's probably what i would do i would say well if i was in their position with their knowledge i'd probably come up with a similar um idea mm -hmm. i feel like it might benefit you more if we uh, you know try this alternative uh, method and um, oh. if, if you blame people all the time, it's not helpful, um, oh. like creating this antagonism there. So do you ever have a very gentle way of saying, um, you know, I to the patient disagree that was, that yeah. was utter bullshit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what would be the opposite of that? that you I mean, you might, you just you have might a beautiful, to... gentle way. Go yeah. on, or you must have one. <laughs> yeah. You might want to say that obviously. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. And but there are times when I disagree, and, and I'll just say, look, I'm, I just have to say I disagree with that, um, and then um, yeah, back, back it back up, whatever it is. Yeah, I'm trying to be kind, but 
yeah but but, but if, if we're following a sort of coaching exploring routine it would be it would be easier to say how do you feel about what they've um recommended or or what your treatment's been like so far um mm. what's worked because yeah. there might be elements of what they've done that have been really effective yeah you need just a little bit of refining and 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 yeah and so it doesn't just dismiss it completely there could have been really good uh, um could have been really good elements to the treatment that they had but some negative and yeah that's interesting tim that's a good one um regular okay. answered um well we could do this uh, uh, for another hour couldn't we here but yeah i love this question though what are you doing with patients who always say uh yes but um, <laughs> <laughs> which as my wife tells me if there's a but that dismisses anything that went beforehand <laughs> um, so, true. Yeah. so uh yeah you you hear that don't you and um sometimes it's helpful to just take you know notice and ask them to notice um mm. yeah yeah interesting Tim we could go on about this for another hour I know we could um, but time is up and of course there will be another one of these in a couple of weeks time we haven't decided what the topic's going to be but actually very often um, the next the topic of the next session is informed by perhaps some of the questions that we don't get to in this session and, and points in direction that you give us from um within the audience so tim and i'll have a chat afterwards and decide what we're going to talk about um i do just want to give a, a little plug to a session that tim is doing tim just mentioned coaching there and um through la pub tim's doing a free half an hour session on friday about um becoming a clinical coach um so moving from being a fixer um of patients to a facilitator to help your patients to own their own recovery. So he's doing that with somebody called Richmond Stace. Um, so if you're interested in that, I'm just gonna drop the link to, to um, sign up for that webinar in the chat. But Tim, could you just tell the audience just a little bit more about the format of winter school? So if there is anybody here that is interested in doing the Explain Pain course um, for the first time or even again because many people do come on it every um couple of years just to refresh um then would you just give us a little bit of info about the format and how that can work for people thank you absolutely yeah so the winter school runs uh weekly the sessions are recorded so some people will be live some people can't be live we've had people who haven't been able to be live for any of them um and can get lots still just reading just watching the recordings um, it's a bit different from a standard explain pain course where I will give some exercises to try each week and get some feedback about those so we can reflect on how things have gone clinically with us. Uh, a little bit of reading to do um, uh, and I, I, someone didn't call it a journal club, but I would say it's less a journal club, more a <laughs> observation of science and, and, and um, just opening up. What I want to do is open up um, some uh, interest in different areas in, in the pain world. Um, so, so we'll have a, a little paper to read, some a bit more sciencey, more philosophical, philosophical, etc. Um, and then we spend time discussing what we're doing now, which is what explain pain is as an approach and how we go about it and how pain affects people. And, and yeah, um, and to be honest, um, the curriculum is a little bit dynamic <laughs> because it will depend on what I'm interested in, in at the time um, will, you know, influence the paper that I send out or what we're talking about is influenced by the group and the experiences they're bringing in as well. So it's quite a lovely opportunity as a as a as a, a clinician to um, it's like peer mentoring session. Yeah. It, so you're getting knowledge and understanding from, from so many different areas. And um, I, that's something I've loved, actually. It, yeah. Yeah, it's a really it's a really great format. And actually, we are getting superb feedback from people about the um, style in which this eight week course is taught. So um, don't be alarmed. Um, 
it starts on the 22nd of November, but we do have a two week break for Christmas. So that also works very well. So you do a few sessions, weekly sessions before Christmas, you have a two week break and then you come back in the new year and do some more. And Tim's always way too humble to say, but one of the best bits is that you get to spend 10 weeks with Tim. <laughs> <laughs> under his uh, supervision and you can ask him as many questions as you like and we are just getting superb feedback from the results that people are having following this course in their clinical practice with their patients so um thank you everybody for joining live today tim and i absolutely love doing these sessions uh so uh we'll be back in a couple of weeks time um so yeah We'll see you in a couple of weeks and thanks again for joining live and thank you for all your fantastic questions which keep us inspired for for next time and um and alert. <laughs> yeah, <on my> <laughs> <laughs> thanks Tim and thank you everybody for joining. We'll see you again soon. Bye bye.